Okay, um, hello again. In this video, I would be talking about the absolute methods of standard setting. Uh, the absolute methods of a standard setting are essentially the most commonly used ones in uh, education in general. Uh, in an exam uh, situation, um, as discussed previously, you would like the competent students to pass and those who are incompetent to uh, stay behind. And then the question would be, where would you like to place your pass mark? Uh, would it like to be like 50% or would you like to move it to 60%? And then the question would be, why 50%? Why 60%? So why not 62% or why not 56%? Um, the probably the most uh, undefensible way would be that you set um, a score and say okay so that that's it so that that's my pass score um, ha and believe it or not that's that's the most commonly actually used one at the moment and uh, many of the universities uh, they do have a pass rate at 50 percent so in order to compensate uh, for this and in order to make that defensible uh, there have been several methods um, introduced uh, to education um, which uh, you can see a list of them uh, and these are probably the most famous and most commonly used and I'll be going through them one by one just to show you how these methods are helping uh, to compensate for um, different variables which can happen during an examination scenario. For example, uh, an examination which is a bit harder um, should probably have a pass uh, mark which is slightly lower and vice versa. Now to start with, I'm going to start with the Nadelsky method of a standard setting and this method is essentially based on a uh, number of the distractors a borderline candidate can eliminate. I'll just explain that uh, with an example. So just imagine you've got uh, a single best answer or a multiple choice question uh, and it says in endodontics which method provides the best tooth isolation. So now remember again you have to put yourself in the shoes of a borderline candidate. So that's that uh, just minimally competent student who you are going to allow to go through. So he's not the brightest, he's not average, he's just borderline candidate. And you just have to look at the five distractors you've got here and just see how many of them a borderline candidate can possibly eliminate uh, and for sure uh, be 100% sure that these are not going to be one of the possible answers. So uh, a borderline candidate might have a look at uh, option A, cotton wool roll and gauze. Um, yeah, they, they might actually use that for endo isolation, rubber them, probably actually they would do the retraction cord, probably they can eliminate uh, that distractor and for the same reason high volume suction saliva ejector probably a borderline candidate can eliminate these distractors as well so a borderline candidate will be probably choosing between one of these two options in other words he's got the chance of one out of two or fifty percent to be able to answer this question correctly so imagine we've got uh, a paper which has got five uh, SBA or MCQ questions and the first one the candidate had to choose between one of the two possible distractors and was able to eliminate three of them so one out of two so it's got uh, 0 0.5 uh, that would be the, the chance of that question being answered correctly by a borderline candidate. So if you just move on to the second one, for example, uh, the borderline candidate could eliminate two of the distractors happily, so then he's got a choice of one out of three uh, for that single item. And then if you just carry on, just as an example, so in the third one, it's got the chance of one out of four, in the fourth one, has got the chance of one out of two, and the fifth one has got a chance of one out of three. So if you just then add up all these odds together, you get one one uh, 1.91 and you had a total of five questions so you can divide 1.91 uh, 1 over 5 and then multiply it by 100 to give it a pass a score for that uh, given paper uh, which in this example is going to be 38 percent um, so 
The Nadelsky uh, method is an absolute method and just based on the number of distractors. The only problem with the Nadelsky is it only works for the multiple choice question or the single best answer items and you cannot use it for any other uh, examination or assessment type. Uh, so going back to the uh, different other methods which can also be used and probably the most uh, one of the most famous ones is the Angoff. Now the Angoff is a variation of the Nadelsky method and uh, he was trying to by uh, producing this method uh, compensate for the fact that Nadelsky can only be used for SPA and MCQ questions. Uh, now I just want to ask you a very very difficult question. If, if I gave you this SBA question and told you, all right then, so tell me uh, a borderline candidate, what's the likelihood of that person answering this question correctly? What would you say from 1 to 100? That's a really, really difficult question, isn't it? So that's actually how the Angoff method works. So if you had um, an exam paper uh, of like, you know, five items, um, he would just actually ask a panel of judges to guess what is the likelihood of a borderline candidate to correctly answer each item. So in this example, we said like it was 50% chance of the borderline candidate answering the first item correctly, 80% for the second item, 60% for the third item, and just go on. Um, so, and then the, the, the same applies as the Nadalski, so just sum up all the odds and then divide it and then multiply it by 100. And the good thing about the Angoff method was uh, then you can actually use it for any type of exam. So uh, it's not necessarily MCQs or SBAs because you're just guessing the odds of uh, a borderline candidate being able to answer. The problem is it's very difficult to judge because uh, how good of a judge should you be in order to be able to even correctly or even close to being correct, guess what is the likelihood of answering a question correctly. So for that reason, people actually made some modifications to the Angoff method to make it work a little bit better. So the modified Angoff, which is extremely commonly used, and we use it here at the School of Dentistry as well, uh, works on the basis of the likelihood of the number of marks which a borderline candidate can gain out of the total marks of pretty much every every single item of a question. So say for example if instead of that uh, example which I showed you one single question and ask you what's the likelihood of borderline candidate being able to answer correctly, if I told you we've got um, an MCQ paper of five items. Now, out of these five items, how many items do you think a borderline candidate can answer correctly? So that's a very different approach now. And then you will have a look at all the five items and just say, oh, well, yeah, so the first one, uh, they can probably answer the second one, no, they can, third one, yes, fourth one, yes, fifth one, no. So then, so three out of five can be answered by a borderline candidate, and then uh, the pass mark would be 60%. That's how you set your 60%. Uh, so if this is actually, if, if you look at the paper of five items on MCQ, you can however implement this to the other uh, examination or assessment types. For example, here is a um, short answer question item and uh, let's have a look at this. So you're about to start a root canal treatment for a lower left five. Now mention five methods that can be used to isolate the tooth. How many root canals does this tooth have and what is your estimated working length based on uh, average data available? Now each of these items, they've got uh, marks uh, individually and then you as a judge you might have a look and say well a borderline candidate probably out of five methods they can at least actually mention three of them and then for the second item um, a borderline candidate probably actually can answer that one and then the last item you don't think so and remember you always have to bear in mind at what year uh, you're looking at uh, and say for example we are uh, giving this example for a fifth year dental student so if we just now 
at all the marks which we thought a borderline candidate can uh, gain from this item. It's going to be 3 plus 1, it's going to be 4, so it's 4 out of 8 a borderline candidate uh, possibly actually can get of this. So if we had um, five questions in our short answer question paper and uh, the first item has got a total mark of 8 and the second one has got 12 and so on and then in the first one a borderline candidate you expect um, that's going to get 4 out of 8 and then 8 out of 12 for the second one and so on all you have to do then is just to add up what you think a borderline candidate can get in this example, it's 25, and then you divide it by the total mark possible for that uh, paper, which is 15 here, and uh, you just uh, calculate the percentage. In this example, it just happened to be 50%. So the pass mark for this paper is going to be 50%. So that's how the modified angle works. Um, so, and because it's a bit more flexible, it's been more logical. It can be actually applied to a variety of exam methods, but not to all of them. So here we've got another method called eval, which uh, is also a very, very commonly used method. And it works based on the item importance and also item difficulty. Now, the way it works is, in terms of item difficulty, they would uh, divide um, a question into one of these three categories. So a question could be hard, uh, which means a borderline candidate would not be able to, well, cannot answer. Uh, it could be moderate, if a borderline candidate may or may not answer that, and easy, if a borderline candidate can answer that. And in terms of um, uh, item importance, it can be, again, subdivided into three categories. So now, the, in terms of importance, um, you have to, again, bear in mind that um, you are looking at safe beginners. If you're not familiar with this terminology, please uh, look at the video, uh, which is first in the series, uh, to talk about the GDC guidelines. But essentially, um, if you think in terms of importance, an item is essential, it means that a competent candidate uh, needs to know about this. If it's important, it means that generally it's an important item to ensure competency, but it's not necessary and still they can do dentistry safely. And if it's supplementary, it means that it really doesn't affect competency. Uh, and you will actually know a little bit better if uh, I show you some examples. Uh, sometimes when people are doing the eBell method, they've got a force category and they call it questionable which uh, they cannot really put a question in any of these but for the sake of simplicity I'm just actually looking at these three rather than uh, the four option one. So let's have a look for some, uh, to, to some examples. Just imagine you would like to uh, look at this simple question and um, say in terms of importance or item importance whereabouts you would like to put it as a judge. So what is the gold standard of tooth isolation in endodontics? Uh, you probably actually in, in your mind something just shouting it's going to be a rubber dam, it's going to be a rubber dam. Now is this essential knowledge? Uh, so does a competent uh, dentist as a safe beginner need to know this? Uh, is it important or is it supplementary? Uh, you're probably actually between essential and important uh, and this is why you need like really actually have a panel of judges. Um, I myself as a single judge I would just say this is an essential item, uh, a borderline candidate, a safe beginner uh, needs to know uh, what, what is a gold standard for two size isolation in the dentics. Uh, but you might argue that, and then um, uh, if you've got a, a panel of judges, then we can actually just discuss this and come into a conclusion. Uh, let's have a look at this, this item. How many root canals does a lower second premolar have? Is this essential, is it important or supplementary? Now, uh, so if a dental student who I let through to graduate, and if he or she doesn't know how many root canals does a lower second premolar have, does it make him incompetent? Uh, probably he would end up removing a little bit more tooth tissue, so it's not great, but it's not really actually a safety issue. So uh, you may again argue between essential and important. I personally would put that in an important item, but it's not essential if that makes sense. But again, you can argue and then decide. 
Um, now look at, let's have a look at this uh, item. So what is the water con content of root dentin vital tooth? Um, so is it essential, is it important or is it supplementary? So if you as a dentist you don't know what is the water content in the root dentin, then uh, would you become unsafe? Probably not. So you can say this is probably a supplementary um, um, a category rather than essentially important. Now let's look at item difficulty and um, see what you are going to uh, mention about this item. So same same question, would you put this as hard, would you put it as moderate or easy? I think when it comes to item difficulty, one of the things you have to bear in mind is what about are they in terms of their training and how frequently and how recently they have been exposed to that piece of knowledge. So say if this is a question uh, asked to third year students that they've never been exposed to this, uh, it could be a hard item or it could be a moderate item, uh, but if this is like, you know, fifth year students and they had a symposium and there was a lot of emphasis on this particular piece of knowledge, then you might actually rank it slightly differently. Uh, let's have a look at another item. So how many root canals does a lower second premolar have? Again, if you ask a first year dental student, it might be uh, a moderate or even a hard question if they have not been exposed to this piece of knowledge yet. However, if you ask a third year dental student, it becomes easier or moderate. And for a fifth year student, probably it's going to be an easy item to answer. So when you go through all your um, questions, in a given paper, then you write a matrix or a draw, draw a matrix uh, with these factors. So you've got the hard, moderate and easy uh, on one side and you've got essential, important and supplementary on the other side. So let's for a sake of uh, simplicity and example, uh, we pick um, an MCQ paper with 100 questions in that and then after you go through each item, you say, for example, five of the items were hard and essential, 12 were moderate and essential, uh, 13 were easy and essential, and so on for the rest of the items. Uh, and then, as a panel of judges, you have to sit down and say, okay, then, so let's redraw this matrix, you ignore what you actually just written down. And then, as a borderline candidate, uh, what is the likelihood of a borderline candidate answering a hard essential question correctly and what's the likelihood of a borderline candidate answering a moderate and essential question and so on. So as a panel of judges you come up with these percentages and numbers and I just put these percentages as an example and I don't think they are like too far from reality. So borderline candidates in their fifth year for, uh, for instance, essential uh, but hard items, probably, they've got 70% likelihood of answering those correctly, whilst a supplementary and hard, only like 20%, if not even actually zero. So as a panel of judges, you sit down and you, you, you come to an agreement on this matrix. And then all you have to do is you have to multiply each of those items by those percentages to get the likelihood of each part of your matrix uh, to be answered co correctly by a borderline candidate. So I've done the calculation for you and all you have to do is just to add all these numbers together to give you the final pass mark for that exam paper which just happened to be 63% for this 100 item MCQ or SBA uh, paper. Uh, so here we uh, had a uh, quick chat about the Nadalski method, Angoff and modified Angoff and Evil, and they were all within the category of absolute uh, standard setting methods. Uh, in the next video, I would be talking about the relative methods, so I will see you very, very shortly.